Today, a video came out. Putin was warning Poles not to interfere in Ukraine. He said that he knows that Poles have some desires about Ukraine and Belarus. He says that it doesn't matter if you, you are under NATO umbrella. Right. You, you are going to get killed like Ukrainians. And on the list, going to be Lithuanians as well. How, how, why, why he sent his, this message personally? Because it, it, sh it should be something so serious that he, he, he personally sent his message. As for Polish leaders, they probably expect to form a coalition under the NATO umbrella and intervene directly in the conflict in Ukraine in order to get a bigger peace for themselves. To regain, as they believe, their historical territories, today's western Ukraine. It is well known that they also dream about Belarusian lands. But as for Belarus, it is part of the Union state, and unleashing aggression against Belarus will mean aggression against the Russian Federation. The Polish authorities, hatching their revanchist plans, do not tell the truth to their people either, and the truth is that the Ukrainian cannon fodder is obviously not enough for the West, so the plan to use new expendable material, Poles themselves, Lithuanians and further on down the list, everyone who is not missed. It just tells me that the Russians have intelligence, um, I don't know if it's human, or uh, overhead imagery, or signal intercept, or a combination of all three, but they clearly know what, Pol what Poland is planning to do, and planning to uh, launch an operation uh, perhaps against Belarus, and in order to bring NATO into the battle, because they realize right now that uh, Ukraine is losing, they're losing badly. Uh, they're, you know, they're no longer able to keep up the pretense that Ukraine is winning or Ukraine is fighting Russia to a stalemate. It's just the opposite. Uh, Russia is crushing Ukraine. And Poland is, I think, trying to, in, a, in an act of desperation, thinking that they might be able to pull something off that would force a NATO response. Uh, but the problem they've got is, NATO does not have the kind of force capable of responding that would make a difference in the battlefield. You see that this, this bombing of Crimean bridge again, and the first time they did that, they, they didn't, and it, it didn't end up well for, for Ukrainians. Now right. again, they're doing this, and the Russians are saying that the Ukrainian did this in co coordination with CIA and MI6. How, how do you see this? Well, I, I, I think it's more likely this was done in coordination with the British as opposed to the Americans. Uh, the British have been much more active in this regard. And it was, it was an attack that designed to coincide with the end of the grain deal uh, as sort of a, a warning to Russia. And Russia in turn has, has issued a warning to all countries that would think about sailing their ships into the Black Sea through the Bos Bosphorus uh, Straits, uh, that uh, they're entering hostile territory and will be treated as if they are carrying military uh, supplies that would uh, in fact uh, cooperate um, them to uh, board the ship to inspect. And they, they're talking, this grain deal, it seems that Russia said just 2.8% of this deal goes to developing countries. The rest goes to Europe, to Turkey. It seems that the big loser of this suspension of grain deal is, is Europe, isn't it? Yes, no, that's correct. Uh, they were the, Europe and Ukraine. Because uh, Ukraine was earning a hefty amount of uh, cash as a result of this kind of uh, transaction. And you know, I think it was upwards of $500 million a month, uh, which, you know, no, no telling where that money's going. But it was a, a significant financial contribution. And despite all the pretense that the rest of the world is going to starve, uh, the reality was the, the bulk of that, those shipments went to developed, so-called developed countries, the countries in Europe, and uh, even to China. 
uh, today U.S. officials said that cluster bombs were delivered to Ukrainians, and they they said that they are using these bombs in an acceptable manner. I don't know what does it mean. How how they can how they can verify that, and we we have the other interview that Zeluzhny gave to Washington Post. He said it does nobody can check what we are what we're gonna do when the, when the weapons come here. We decide how we're gonna use them, and we we see today that they they're talking about bombing the ships that going to Russia. How how we can put all these pieces together? Well, the the, the cluster munitions are not going to be used to attack naval targets. So that you know, take that off the table. U Ukraine has had no no regrets at all over the last nine years of attacking and killing civilians in the Donbass. Uh, so whether or not they're now going to use the cluster munitions on civilian targets remains to be seen. I, I personally think that they actually probably will be very careful not to use those in urban settings where, uh, to, against civilian targets. But what, it, what even if they use them on the battlefield, it's going to rip the lid off this and uh, Russia will return the favor with the difference being that Russia has more of these kinds of weapons than Ukraine does. And Ukrainian troops are in a much more vulnerable position because they're, they're in trenches and such. And these little bomblets actually work most effectively on troops in trenches. And as you mentioned, the Ukrainian in this counteroffensive, they're, they're experiencing heavy losses. And General Mark Milley said that one of the biggest problems that they're facing in this counteroffensive is the is minefields. How yeah. what's the problem with that? Well, I, I wonder where was everybody asleep over the last six months, six, seven months? Um, when when Russia pulled out of Kherson and pulled out of Kharkiv uh, last fall, they then embarked upon a very public it was announced and it was available in videos of building defensive and defensive entrenchments uh, along the southern front. And in, in the course of that, they erect three different defensive lines. And then in front of that, they put a mine. So they, you know, NATO with its, uh, you know, very robust uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capabilities. Uh, were able to monitor and see where these mines were being planted. Uh, you know, I, for, for the life of me, I, I don't know what magic formula they thought they were going to use to traverse the minefields. But as, as we saw in the early days of the uh, counteroffensive, Ukraine could not penetrate the minefields because it had blown up uh, key vehicles, the Bradley uh, armored personnel carriers, uh, tanks, the leopard tanks, and uh, then the soldiers themselves were trapped in some of these minefields in ways that, that earlier there was one horrific video where you can see at least five five different uh, soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, with a, their lower right or flank blown off. And you see it real time. You see them applying the tourniquet to try to stop from bleeding out. So they just, uh, you know, the, this was predictable. Uh, I predicted it, uh, that without air power, without adequate mobile artillery and a mobile air defense to force Russia uh, air capabilities back, they, they had zero chance of success, zero. And that's what's uh, unfolded. Italian newspaper, it's called Corriere della Sera. It says that it's reported on Ukraine, a situation in Ukraine said Ukraine is empty. People, many people, many people are leaving Ukraine. They're not getting back. They're not coming back. And it, it, it's, it's, it's summation shows that something like 28 to 31 million people are living now in Ukraine. It's, it says that it's so optimistic. This, this estimation. Yeah. How, how dire well, is the situation in Ukraine? 
Well, remember that at the start of this, you know, war or special military operation, depending on who you, if you're Russian, it's an SMO, and if you're Ukrainian, it's war. Uh, Ukraine had a, a population of roughly 41 million people. So at least around 11 million have left the country and probably are not coming back. No. So that is a significant blow to Ukraine, both from a sta manpower standpoint, where are they going to get the soldiers to replace all those who have been killed or wounded so far in the, in the last 18 months of combat? Um, on top of that, it affects the national wealth. So it's, uh, Ukraine is a country in the process of being hollowed out is uh, the simplest way I can put it. And in a new poll that came out from Europe, it shows that just 11% of people in Hungary and 28% in Greece and 38% of people in Italy are supporting the, 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 the Zelensky administration, its, its foreign policy. And more than 50% of Austrian, Bulgarian, Greece, Hungary, Slovakia, and Cyprus are against sending more weapons to Ukraine. And right. how we can draw the picture of the, the support for Ukrainian in Europe. Well, the Ukraine is not winning. You know, people, people love winners. They like to cheer for the soccer team that wins. Uh, they like to cheer for the chess player that wins. And for the one that is losing, there is little enthusiasm or support. And after months of being repeatedly told that Ukraine was winning, 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 and, and the opposite was true, the, the, the fact of their defeat is now being exposed and being exposed in a very grand way. You know, a year ago, you had roughly 16% of the population knew somebody that had been killed or, or wounded in, in the war. Uh, now that number is approaching 80%. So think about that. Eight out of every 10 people living in Ukraine wow. know somebody who's been killed or wounded in combat against the Russians. That's, uh, that means there's an extraordinary number of casualties. And Ukraine simply does not have the manpower resources to draw upon to sustain combat operations they have been carrying out so far. And uh, Janet Yellen uh, says that Ukraine aid is the best boost for the global for the global economy. Do we know what is she talking about? It's uh, great for U.S. defense contractors who are being given more money to try to make up for the, the weapon systems that have been emptied from U.S. Uh, military warehouses. Uh, one of the sort of the, the other uh, unspoken truths about the war is that many of the U.S. weapons that were taken as you know game changers, and, uh, you know highly accurate like the Patriot, have performed very poorly. Uh, uh, same thing for you know javelin, uh, anti-tank. Uh, missile system, uh, stingers, the surface-to-air missile to go after aircraft. Uh, none of these U.S. supplied weapons have changed anything about Russia to win this contest. It has failed to strengthen Ukraine and to make Ukraine more effective on the battlefield. So that, uh, you know, from that standpoint, it's going to be a downside for some of these corporations. But still... The, the Joe Biden's asking the Congress and the Congress is half of which is run by Republicans are ponying up the money to continue the spending spree. So it's, it's good for business in that regard. It's bad for the people that are asked to go fight. In, in, if you remember in May, 2022 business insider published an article describing how 20 members of Congress, they're holding stock of top 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 weapon companies and these yeah, some yeah. of them are, are sitting on, on on the congressional committee that regulates defense policy how all right. these pieces are are connected together well it, it, 
that's what this has been developing in Washington, D.C., really starting about 40 years ago. Uh, and I marked that as time when I first moved to the Washington, D.C. area in 1979. There was, uh, there, you did not have massive luxury car dealerships around. So, for example, you did not have Lamborghini and Ferrari dealers and Bentley and uh, Rolls Royce dealers. They do you have them now. So what is what's happened over the last 40 years is as the U.S. defense budget has grown, the influence of these defense contractors has increased. And it increases because they provide donations that go to members of Congress and they contribute to both Republicans and Democrats. And so there are members on both sides of the aisle, as they say here, that are benefiting from this. So they get paid uh, to approve, the Congress gets paid to approve more money to send to the defense contractors. So it's really a vicious, corrupt circle. And the weapons that have been approved and that are being built are not weapons that reflect a coordinated strategy of national defense. It's more like saying, what can we buy that's gonna look cool and maybe be effective. And so the, the, none of these weapons, I'll you know, give you an example. Uh, they're build, still building aircraft carriers to the tune of 12, 13 billion dollars. Well, the United States, if it fields an aircraft carrier in the China Sea, they're gonna lose that aircraft carrier because the Chinese have hypersonic missiles and the US ships have no defense against those hypersonic missiles. Yet, when you're spending $12 billion on that kind of ship, you would expect it to have something approaching a long lifetime, which, which it won't. So it's, a, it's, it's something that if, if, the, if the United States gets engaged with a shooting war with the Chinese or Russia, it's going to lose lots of, of very, very expensive ships. You will receive many different messages from, from, from the Western countries in, in considering the Ukraine war. For example, the, the Pentagon intelligence chief said that sending weapons to Ukraine is not going to change the the, the 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 war that is going on on the battlefield, and right. it's not game changer. And we have the Ukrainian foreign minister in an interview with CBS telling that they're winning this war. It's it's, it's he's living in an alternative reality. And, and we have this foreign minister, British foreign minister, that says, calls on Putin to withdraw all the troops and unblock the Black Sea. How realistic is that? Yeah, well, there's, there's no coherent message. And part of the problem is, and I wrote about this last week, when, when you look at NATO in terms of troop size, you know, which country fields uh, the largest number of men uh, for military men that can be used in the conflict, uh, the United States is number one. Uh, number two, in terms of actual numbers, uh, is uh, Ukraine. Ukraine, even, even though they're not a member of NATO, Ukraine has been treated as a de facto member of NATO. And so they've been, they've been treated uh, as if they were a real member. Now, they participated in every annual exercise going back to 2014. So, and, and joint military exercises with NATO and with the U.S. European Command being carried out on Ukrainian soil. Uh, after Ukraine, the next largest army is Turkey. Uh, think of it this way. Ukraine, at the start of the special military operation last February, had more troops more military personnel, both active and reserve, than the United Kingdom, France, and Germany combined. So, you know, people perceive France, Germany, and Britain as the big powers uh, in NATO. And the reality is they're, they're weaklings now. They, they, they barely can field, uh, you know, a couple of divisions to take the, take the field. So it's, that's one of the reasons it's been driving NATO expansion, and yet, because they have more troops from uh, new new members, 
But now we were witnessing that this second, think of it this way, the second largest army in NATO, uh, Ukraine, is being defeated by the Russians. So that is why there's a panic developing in the West. They're trying to figure out some way to extricate, extricate themselves from the situation. Because this is not the first time, Larry, we, we know that when Blinken went to China to negotiate with them, when he came back, Biden called Xi as, as a dictator. You see, sending right. those those different messages, then those a country like China, <clears throat> like Russia, doesn't know how to how to respond. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's um, all mark of a successful presidency is consistency in managing the message and make sure that all elements of the different intelligence and military bureaucracies when you're dealing with national security issues like Ukraine or Russia, that they are all singing from the same sheet of music, that they've all agreed upon what the key notes are that they're going to follow. And you certainly do not have that any longer uh, because you've got the U.S. Uh, at uh, it's got two or three different commandos basically going on in Europe right now. And it's not clear really who is in charge. You see, because when, when they're criticizing Donald Trump and his administration, they were talking about that Trump is unpredictable. But it seems that Biden administration in the most unpredictable administration. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. you uh, I think you nail it there that um, you listen to what Joe Biden says and then you can probably bet on the opposite as being true. You know, you said they're never going to deploy tanks. Oh, they're going to deploy tanks. We're never going to deploy F-16. They're going to deploy F-16. We're never going to deploy cluster munitions. They deploy cl cluster munitions. Does not build faith and trust that when Biden says something, you can count it. In fact, just the opposite. Whatever Biden says and makes a promise about, believe the opposite, because the opposite is what's likely to happen. Uh, Larry, yesterday, Michael McFaul tweeted that the, sanction or the sanctions are not working. It's time <laughs> for bolder actions. What, what, what does he mean? Bolder action means I have no nuclear idea. war? Yeah. I have no, I have no idea what he's talking about. He's a madman, for starters. I mean, I, I congratulate him that he finally, you know, thank you, Captain Obvious. Yeah, the sanctions are not working and have not, not been working for the last eighteen months. Uh, they expected the immediate collapse of Russia. It didn't happen. They expected the Ukrainian military to defeat Russia. It didn't and is not going to happen. So now they're trying to figure something out. Uh, for him to claim you need bolder action, uh, bolder action would mean putting NATO troops, particularly U.S. troops, in combat. And if, they, if that happens, those U.S. US troops are going to get killed and killed in massive numbers, numbers that the United States really hasn't seen since uh, the Korean War. You know, significant casualties, not just incidental casualties. So... Yeah. Uh, pe people like, you shouldn't listen to McFall. Do you see any willingness in the Biden administration to do that? To negotiate or to, to go to send, forward and to send more, more. To, to send troops to Ukraine? No, well, they've already done, they've already done that. They've already announced that. Uh, they, they're sending uh, three, three brigades, you, you know, each brigade figures around 15,000 troops. So they sent up to almost 50,000 troops into Poland, Romania. Uh, and, you know, all that is going to do is raise the alarm on the part of the Russians and create more targets that Russia may at some point down the line feel it needs to attack. Thank you, Larry, for being with us today. It was a great pleasure to talk with you, to chat with you here. I always enjoy our chest. You have a great weekend. Thank you.